Welcome to the History Den YouTube channel. This is the 14th video in the Ancient Greek series. Today we are going to examine the rise of the Athenian Empire. Now in the last video we wrapped up the Persian Wars and we talked about the development of the Delian League which arose after the Spartans left the Greco-Persian War. Athens of course decides to keep the war going but the nature of the Delian League begins to change from something that was about fighting the Persians to an entity that was about furthering the Athenians own interests. And so in this video we will discuss that transformation to the Athenian Empire. We will examine both what is going on in Athens and what is happening to the Delian League itself. So as I mentioned before, the Spartans want out of the war, but the Athenians didn't want to abandon the league, so it was the Athenians that would fill the vacuum left by the Spartans. Also, the Spartans believed the war was over, but it was easier for the Spartans to make that decision since they could go hole up in the Peloponnesus and block the Isthmus if the Persians came back again. Athens and the other Ionian cities didn't have that luxury, and therefore they were far more exposed geographically than the Spartans were. So let's look at some of the reasons why the Delian League was formed. The first reason was to take revenge and remove the threat of Persia. So the key point to understand here is the original intent of this was to remove the threat of Persia, and in a sense it was Athens and all of the League members combined providing security to the Greek city-states around the Aegean Sea. Over time, that reason becomes less clear. The other key point to understand here is there was no provision in the Charter whatsoever that you were required to stay in the League. You could leave if you wanted. Take a look at Sparta. They left the Greek League and several other members did as well. So the Delian League has that same principle early on. That too will start to change later, as we will see. The other reason is booty. These were huge financial enterprises. And of course, what is the primary motivation for booty? Well, it helped fund the Delian League and keep the war going against Persia. This war booty brought enormous wealth not just to Athens, but many of the Delian League members. Sailors also that participated in the Delian League Navy could also become independently wealthy. It's also important to note that every member got one vote, and each vote carried equal weight. But even though the vote is technically the same vote, the Athenians were looked at as the de facto leader. And eventually they will use their power to influence votes in their favor. And this is what slowly begins to move this into an Athenian empire. But the transformation from the Delian League to more of an Athenian empire did not happen overnight. It was more of a process. And as I said, initially the intentions were good. So it changes from a collection of states with a common goal to a league that is run by Athens for its own interests. So if you take a look at that map below, you can see all the city-states in yellow that are part of the Delian League. And Athens is over here in the red. And as you can see, they have complete domination of the Aegean Sea from the coast of Ionia all the way over to the Greek mainland. And they're setting a huge buffer against the Persian Empire, which of course is right here in modern day Turkey and heads east. Okay, let's take a look now what's going on in Athens in terms of the leadership during the times of the Delian League. Now, of course, Themistocles is the hero of the Persian Wars. He was the man with the plan and is the key figure in the decisive Battle of Salamis. So after 480 BC, there's every reason to believe that Themistocles would continue as the leader of the Athenians. But that does not happen. And throughout the 470s BC, he begins to lose power gradually. Part of the problem was he was very arrogant and wanted to take credit, and rightfully so I might point out, for the victories over Persia at Salamis. He became so popular that Plutarch relates this story that when Themistocles arrived at the Olympic Games, everybody stops watching the games and starts watching him. So he has this JFK type popularity. This arrogance rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, especially in Athens. Now, on his way to power in Athens, Themistocles used ostracism to get rid of all of his rivals. While well, they eventually turned the tables and used that very tactic against him, and he too was ostracized. Now, Cimon, who was Themistocles' main political rival, takes over the reins in Athens. Cimon represents the conservative faction, and it's also important to note that he was the son of Miltiades. You will remember Miltiades is the hero at Marathon. And so it is Cimon who will take the lead in every campaign the Delian League participates in. 
So Cimon is the central player in the Delian Wars, as Themistocles was the key player in the Persian Wars. Interestingly enough, Cimon was also a great supporter of Sparta, and you would think someone like that would not be popular in Athens, but that wasn't the case. He was extremely popular in Athens, and part of the reason for this success was he was really a great general. He won numerous victories when he was leading the Delian League. So Cimon always favored a very pro-Spartan policy, and this is probably part of the reason that Sparta did not object to the Athenian expansion because of Cimon. And amazingly, Cimon is in charge for almost two decades, which is a really long time in Athenian politics. So let's take a look at some of the key events that show how the character of Athens begins to change in terms of its relationship with the other Delian League members. The first event involves the town of Charistus on the island of Euboea. Now you will remember that Charistus had resisted the Persians during the second Persian invasion and their city was destroyed as a result. Well now, after the Greco-Persian Wars, Athens attacks the city sometime in the 470s BC. And so the people of Charistus must have wondered, what is going on here? First the Persians, and now our very own Greeks are attacking us. So they must have felt somewhat like Czechoslovakia in World War II, where every side is taking advantage of them. So Athens wins the war against Charistus and forces them into the Delian League. Athens also starts this new policy where they rip down the walls of the defeated and force them to pay a permanent tribute. So they're almost using mafia-style tactics against some of the Delian League members. And Athens wants that tribute every year, or there's going to be trouble for whomever refuses to make that payment. Now the second event that causes people to wonder about Athens' intentions involves the island of Naxos. Naxos in 471 BC decides they no longer want to pay the Delian League dues. Like Sparta, they feel the Persian threat is over. Naxos rebels and Athens lays siege to the city. Once again, Athens wins and they force the Naxians to tear down their walls and disband its fleet. And Athens even goes further. They strip the Naxians of their vote in the Delian League, but they are still forced to pay that tribute. A third event occurs in 465 BC, and this involved the island of Thasos. Now, this was really suspect because this didn't even involve matters of the Delian League like the first two events. This was just a quarrel between Thasos and Athens itself over several silver mines. So this really was just an argument about money and minerals. As a result of the dispute, Thasos rebels and the Athenians lay siege. And although the Athenians defeated them by sea, it took two more years to finally take the capital. So this was a prolonged siege that lasted a long time and probably ended around 463 BC. And so the Athenians continued their usual policy and forced the Thasians to destroy their walls, surrender their ships, and pay an annual contribution to the Delian League. And of course, Athens took possession of all the mines that were part of the original dispute. And as I mentioned, what's so different about this is it had nothing to do with the Delian League. And this was seen by the Greeks as the Athenians using the League to further their own interests. And so this is a huge turning point where we can almost mark the beginning of the Athenian Empire. And many of the League allies saw it just like that. They saw the Athenians as forming an empire, which of course is the very reason they were fighting the Persians in the first place. In other words, the Greeks didn't want anything to do with the word called empire. So the behavior of the Athenians is being called into question by all of the Greeks. One other big issue was that the Athenians took the money from the Delian treasury and used it to build their own navy. So as a result of this, many of the League members no longer even had a navy because all of their money went into the treasury. So it's a double bonus for Athens or double jeopardy for the rest of the League members if you think of it that way because not only were they having to contribute their own money to this treasury, they had no navy left to protect them from Athens. So they really were at the mercy of Athens now. So, as we talked about before, Themistocles represented the lower classes. And when Cimon takes over, he kind of represents the upper classes. So, it's kind of like this thing with the Republicans and the Democrats. If the Republicans get power, eventually the voters vote them out, and then the Democrats will take control of Congress. So, you have this back and forth that's going on. And so, at first, it's Miltiades leading, and he represents the land-owning elite. Then Themistocles takes charge, and he represents the lower classes. And then there's 
a return to the conservative faction with Kimon. Now we should keep in mind that even though these guys are the leaders, they still have to be elected every single year. And so even though Kimon represents the upper classes, he also has to take care of the lower classes as well, or he'll be voted out in the annual election. And amazingly, Kimon lasted for 16 or 17 years. He went through 17 different elections and each time was elected. So he must have been very popular, as I mentioned before. But things start to turn south for Kimon. And what's that cliche, when it rains it pours? Well, that's what happens here. And the first problem that occurs is with that expedition we talked about a few slides ago at Thesos. That siege took too long, and this kind of turns into an Iraq war for Kimon. Now, even though it only took two years, you'll remember when we were talking about the phalanx several videos ago, two years is an eternity, because the Greeks were used to ending battles in a few days, sometimes just a few hours. So that war with Thasos becomes very unpopular, and of course they're going to blame Kimon for it, because he's the central leader in Athens. And at this time, the faction that represents the lower classes is led by two guys, Pericles and Ephialtes, and they are constantly issuing inflammatory remarks against Kimon. So it's during this span of time, things don't really bode well for Kimon, and they bring him up on charges. But the trial fails, and Kimon remains in political power. Now, interestingly, it's not an unpopular war that does Kimon in. It's an earthquake that occurs in Sparta. Now, Sparta suffers devastating consequences as a result of that earthquake. And they pretty much accept the help from almost every city-state within Greece. But they reject the help from Athens. Now, this was a severe affront to Athenian pride. And it was almost like, how dare these Spartans insult us like that? I can see members of the Delian League quietly snickering at the Spartans' rebuff of the Athenians. What comes around goes around. You treated us poorly, now see what it's like for you. Well, of course, all of this did not go well in Athens. And so the Athenians needed a scapegoat, and they found an easy target in Chemon, since he had been the main sponsor of the Spartans. And finally, Chemon is ostracized in 461 BC. So interestingly enough, an unpopular war with Thasos couldn't undo him. It was this affront to Athenian pride which finally did him in. Now the irony here could not have been lost on Chemon, since he had used ostracism against Themistocles, that very same tool was used against him. And with that, the Spartan-Athenian relationship took a dangerous step backwards, and relations were never again the same as they were when Chemon was running the show in Athens. And so Pericles takes over, and this ushers in a new age called the Golden Age. And Pericles is undoubtedly one of the great politicians in all of Greek history. In fact, I think if you listed the 20 greatest Athenian politicians out on paper, scratch them all off, and you get left with Pericles. He really was a titanic figure in ancient Athens. Really the Abraham Lincoln, if you want to think of it that way. And deservedly, he will get his own video, and we will take care of that in the next episode.